Welcome. My name is Kim Adams, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth lecture in our 10 part series, Advancing Healthcare Equity with Medical Humanities. This series was developed in partnership with New York University, the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. Our initiative is part of the Foundation's Gold Human Insights webinar series, and we want to express our deepest gratitude to the Gold Foundation for their support and collaboration on the project. I want to recognize my partners as well in the development of this series, Dr. Katie Grogan, who is Senior Education Manager at the Center to Advance Palliative Care at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and Saranik Bosu, who is a PhD candidate in English at NYU, where he focuses on economic thought, literary rhetoric, and public humanities. We're absolutely thrilled to have with us tonight Vignesh Sridharan, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of English at NYU. He studies how the Victorians did research focusing on education reform and women writers. His fields of expertise include Victorian literature, 19th century periodicals, book reviews, British Raj writing, and utopian fiction. In tonight's lecture, entitled Edinburgh, Boston, and Women in the Medical Schools of the 19th Century, he will discuss the confluence of historical circumstances that briefly made degrees for women and med medical education for women synonymous in the press and public debates of 19th century Britain. The conversation about women's medical education in the 1860s reflects an early feminism we recognize alongside 19th century anxieties about sexual knowledge that have grown dim and shows us a moment when professionals and when the professional and intellectual possibilities expand and contract at once. So a few quick logistical notes. We're going to ask that folks kindly keep their mics off and please put your questions into the chat, which we will be monitoring. And then we'll read them aloud during the Q&A portion of the session. Finally, I'm going to drop a link into the chat for a very brief survey. We'd appreciate if everyone could take a few moments to give us their feedback, and this is a necessary step for anyone claiming CME credit. So here's that link, and we'll send it again at the end of the session. And now, thank you all for joining us, and I'm going to stop talking and play a short introductory video from the Gold Foundation. The best healthcare is compassionate, collaborative, and scientifically excellent. Thank you for being on this mission with us to ensure humanism in healthcare for all. This is a Gold Human Insight webinar produced by the Gold Foundation and its partners. Hello, I'm Pia Pine Miller, Senior Director of Strategy and Business Development for the Gold Foundation. The Gold Foundation created the Gold Human Insight webinar series to bring inspirational live and pre recorded webinars to healthcare professionals and learners. Our 2022 theme is renewing our commitment to humanism. With the myriad of challenges facing healthcare systems today, including patient disconnection, clinician burnout, and even more challenges highlighted during this time of the syndemic of COVID and social justice issues, the Gold Foundation's vision of a better future remains more urgent than ever. Today's Gold Human Insight webinar is one in a series that is part of a special collaboration with NYU School of Medicine, which is an institution that is a member of the Gold Partners Council, a group of medical schools, hospitals, and healthcare systems that are leaders in humanism and healthcare. Thank you to our presenters and our audience for everything that you do. 
Today's lecture is the sixth in a 10 part series on advancing healthcare equity with medical humanities. These slides provide a description of the larger series and accreditation information from the NYU CME office. They are required for attendees seeking CME credit and are available to all who are interested through the Gold Foundation website. Okay, and with all that business taken care of, I am going to turn the mic over to Vignesh. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about who I am and how I ended up here very briefly, and then I will share my screen and you can, you know, uh, we can look at uh, some photographs from the 19th century instead of at me. Uh, uh, I live in an English department and the place I live is Victorian literature. And so I thought I should say something about how I ended up here. Uh, the brief answer to that is sometimes medical women, as they were called in the 19th century, sometimes women doctors in the 19th century had the time to write novels. And because they had the time to write novels, those novels fall into my area of research and I ended up here. But the slightly longer answer is that I was interested in how people in the late 19th century did research and more broadly in a question about how people who wrote creatively knew things. Uh, and I was particularly interested in questions of how they knew things before and after they had institutional access to information. Medical education is one of the areas in which you can see that there is a precise date before which women do not have institutional access and after which they do. And it also is part of a long narrative in which women gain more and more access to educational institutions in the United Kingdom. Um, so I'll say a bit more about that, and I'll say a bit more about my involvement, my interest here in a, in a minute, but let me share my screen. Uh, all right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the history of women's education in the 1860s, and how women's medical education is bound up in a more general struggle for education broadly in the United Kingdom and also about how the doctors of Boston and the women physicians and women educators of the United States provide a catalyst for this long series of changes in England and in Scotland. Uh, after that, I'll move on and I'll talk about some different cultural provocations that led to the entry of women into medicine in this period. Uh, this is a movement that we tend to read now as de facto liberal and feminist, but in fact, it has pretty like complex and mixed political affiliations in that period. Uh, and then third, I'll address some of the opposition that the women of the 1860s experienced when they were entering the profession. So here's the first thing I can do. I can bring us to Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson is almost the first woman to be a licensed and practicing doctor in the United Kingdom. Uh, the question of who is actually the first is a little bit complex because there, Elizabeth Blackwell is, for instance, English, uh, but gains her degree abroad, uh, is licensed abroad, and then begins to be allowed to practice medicine post the 1858 medical bill. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about what's happening in the 1860s. A uh, number of relevant things. In, the, in 1858, there is, there is an 1858 UK Medical Act. And what that does is it's a push for standardization. So it creates the Medical Council, which is a body that still exists, and the Office of the Medical Registrar and it decrees which 19 institutions in the United Kingdom are allowed to license people as physicians. At the time, it does not say anything specific about the, the sex of the people who are going to be taking those licensing examinations. It does not stipulate that licensing bodies have to admit women. It also does not stipulate that women cannot sit for examinations. 
what Elizabeth Garrett Anderson does is she applies to any number of institutions. Uh, all the universities reject her one by one, saying that they don't accept women into their MD programs. But she finds that the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries is one institution that has no written rule against allowing women in. And so she joins it in this sort of half, half in, half out way that women were often joining institutions in the 1860s. They admit her to the program. They say that she can take the examinations, but they will not admit her to any of the classes. She has to have private tutoring. And so what she does is she has to raise funds to take uh, a private tutor in classics because you had to pass an examination in Latin, you had to pass an examination in Greek. She hires the uh, anatomy professor who is giving the classes at the Society of Apothecaries and gets him to give her private lessons in anatomy. And then eventually she befriends enough of the professors that she's allowed to come to the operating room and observe surgery. She eventually passes that examination. She is, uh, I believe, the first, uh, I believe that when they, among that set of candidates, she came first. She passes the examination and then she gets the LSA, which is the license from the Society of Apothecaries. And she becomes the, at that time, the first woman in England, uh, first woman in the, in the United Kingdom to be licensed as a doctor. Uh, that loophole, as it is, immediately closes behind her because the various medical institutions are in a tizzy because a woman has managed to find a way in, has managed to take all the exams, has managed to pass them, and has managed to get the license. And there's some discussion in the medical journals of the period about how to prevent this from happening again. And the way they hit upon to prevent it from happening is to say is, well, they, they're not allowed to, to write a law that specifically says, um, they are worried about the legality of excluding women entirely. And so what they do instead is they pass an internal bylaw of the Society of Apothecaries saying, no one who has had private coaching is allowed to sit our examination. At the same time, they're not giving the lessons to women who apply. And so they, the women who do apply after Elizabeth Garrett are caught in this double bind and they're not able to do it again. So that route by which you get to, by, by which you get the license closes immediately. Uh, the 1860s are a particular, it's not surprising that these things happen in the 1860s. The 1860s are actually a central moment in British feminism and a central moment in the women's movement. And I think that some of the key things that have happened in this period are a little bit poorly understood today. So I, I just want to bring them up a little bit. The first, this is 1865 when Elizabeth Garrett Anderson gets her license, the LSA, and then she begins to practice. 1866 is the first petition for the women's vote in Great Britain. Uh, that vote, of course, does not pass, but then it is preceded by um, several petitions in the years following. Uh, the, and in fact, it is a, a near constant in British Parliament until women finally do get the vote 60 years later. But uh, 18, the 1860s, uh, the people who uh, contact John Stuart Mill to get the women's petition for the vote put into Parliament and then uh, written down as a bill before Parliament, uh, are a group of feminists that include the Victoria Press, which was uh, a women-led printing press. Um, they include the women who edited the English Women's Review, which is an early suffrage journal. They include educators like Emily Davies and Barbara Bodikin. And those women are also the people who start petitioning Cambridge to allow women to join. Women first take the Cambridge examinations, that is to say the, the local examinations, which Cambridge used to run as proof of having finished a, a decent secondary education in 1862, but they are not allowed 
admittance to any Cambridge universe, any Cambridge colleges. The first college at Cambridge for women is Girton College, and it is founded in 1869. It is also a signal 1860s achievement. Uh, the first university exams that women sit are at the University of London, also at 1869. Those are not exams that are on par with what the men are taking. It's a slightly, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a, an examination that's called the examinations for ladies. And they are meant to be a little bit harder than school and a little bit easier than college because a lot of the women sitting them have had less formal education than the men would have done. Uh, the person who is the next, the person who in fact writes these lines that I put up here, Miss Garrett and her strength, making me break the 10th commandment, she doing trigonometry, optics, etc., running where I crawl, that person is actually the most important person here. That's Dr. Sophia Jex Blake. Sophia Jex Blake is actually the fulcrum on which the, the lever of this women's medical history turns. Um, she is, she is uh, a person who had been to Queen's College London. Queen's College London is called a college. It's actually something more like what we would think of as a quite competitive high school, but it's a place that's doing a lot of medical reform. Uh, sorry, it's a place that's doing a lot of educational reform. It's founded by F.D. Morris, the famous educational reformer. A great number of people who went on to be quite famous in their fields went to Queen's College London, and it is one of the places that is attempting to get more college level work into women's higher secondary education. Sophia Jex Blake intends to be an educator and what she plans to do is to be uh, a founder of either a girls school or a women's college in England. And she does several things in the 1860s. One of them is she goes to Germany more or less without support and she arrives at a number of uh, women's colleges there and she arrives there and she says, let me be an English teacher and I will observe the work that you do. And miraculously, because the 1860s are a more open time, and in some ways it is helpful that fewer formal qualifications are required to do this kind of thing, they allow her to do it. Then in the 1860s, then later on in the 1860s, in 1865, she sails for Boston because she plans to make a tour of the whole United States, going to all the co-educational institutions and the women's colleges and making notes about the program of study, about the syllabi, about what residential college life is like, what co-educational college life is like. And she wants to write a book about it. And the book is going to be sort of a piece of propaganda arguing for broader women's education in the United Kingdom. So she writes this book, but in the process of writing it, she goes to Boston. In Boston, she meets Lucy Sewell. And that's a really fortuitous meeting. Lucy Sewell at the time is running uh, an institution called the New England Women, New England Hospital for Women and Children. Uh, so a word about Lucy Sewell. She's running this institution and there is nothing like it in England at the time. She goes there, uh, she meets Lucy Sewell, she's astonished by the work that she's doing. Uh, it's a hospital at which Lucy Sewell is the resident physician. Sophia Jex Blake has never met a resident physician who is a woman, a woman before. Uh, Dr. Sewell then also in, like, uh, introduces her to, I think, as many as seven other women MDs. And you can find these letters from Sophia Jex Blake written home saying, I did not know there was such a thing as a woman MD. Uh, Lucy Sewell is a product of another institution, the New England Women and Children's Hospital is providing some clinical experience for women who intend to get medical degrees. Uh, Lucy Sewell herself is the product of a previous institution founded in the 1850s, which has various names. It's called the New England Female Medical College. Uh, previously to that, it was called the Female Medical Education Society, um, the FMES. It was founded by a Dr. Samuel Gregory. That is the first school, I believe, to train women in the field of medicine at all. I'm going to say a word more about that presently, but uh, suffice it to say there is a conservative institution 
the Female Medical Education Society and what we would think of as the progressive institution, which is the Women and Children's Hospital, which had a long life. It lived into the 20th century. Uh, Lucy Sewell, you can find the diary entries of Sophia Jex Blake upon first meeting her. And you can find notes from, you can find long, like decades and decades of correspondence between those two women. They stayed in touch for years after Sophia Jex Blake went back to England. Lucy Sewell comes to visit her there as well. Um, but the day after their first meeting, she says, um, there is a note from Dr. Sewell which says, I'm reading it because it's because it's quite entertaining. She says, my dear Miss Blake, as usual this evening, I enjoyed your society so much that I forgot to say half that I wanted to. If you call on Mr. Emerson today, because they all knew Mr. Emerson, I think you had better call in the afternoon. Don't have any neuralgia when you come to the hospital today, or I may want to try my electromagnetic machine on your face. I have not seen Dr. Zakrzewska yet, but I want you to come early. So I don't know what the electromagnetic machine is that she was going to try on her face, but she's clearly doing this after two days acquaintance. And so you can see them becoming very fast friends. And because of the openness of institutions at this point, one of the things that happens is that Sophia Jex Blake, who has no prior education, may in fact never have taken a biology class, uh, not what we would think of as a modern biology class anyway, is allowed merely through her friendship with the circle of women, merely by knowing the right people, such as Emerson, uh, is allowed ingress into this institution and then is given a little job there. She works in the dispensary and she doesn't have very much to do. She just has to, you know, she has like a sort of billing and packaging uh, of medicines sort of job there. But that allows her to spend several weeks and months in Boston observing this hospital at work and observing women doctors at work. And her, her project, which is to expand education for women, starts to become a project to expand medical education for women, which is to say create medical education for women because it's basically non-existent at this point. Uh, she is she returns to England in 1868 and the, the book comes out, she returns to England in 1866, excuse me. Uh, the book, which is A Visit to Some American Schools and Colleges comes out in 67. She also at this point is befriended by Josephine Butler. Josephine Butler asks her to write an essay for this volume, which is called Women's Work and Women's Culture. The essay that Sophia Jex Blake writes is called uh, Medicine as a Profession for Women. And the curious thing about it is that it is not an essay that's drawing on experience. She's not saying this is what medicine is currently like as a profession for women. It's actually a piece, it's a polemic uh, and a projection into the future in which she says, this is what, this is what medicine will be like as a future profession for women, it is not currently one in the United Kingdom, not in the way that she means it anyway. Josephine Butler is an interesting figure in this period. She is, uh, I can say more about her if anyone's interested, but she is a famous, she's famous in this period as a campaigner against the Contagious Diseases Act of 1866, which are expanded in 1868 and 1869. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Sophia Jex Blake, as these two early women doctors, find themselves on opposite sides of the Contagious Diseases Act. And this is one of the moments at which they are both pushed into the public sphere. Uh, all right, what shall I tell you next? Uh, Girton College, 1869. What Sophia Jex Blake does is she uh, petitions the University of Edinburgh after this for admission into the medical program. At the time, it is a program that you joined uh, having passed a matriculation exam. The matriculation exam presumes that you will be able to do a basic level of mathematics, a basic level of, uh, you'll be able to pass an examination in English and an examination in Latin. So, it, Sophia Jex Blake and four other women become the first ever women to matriculate at a British university, which is to say they joined the University of Edinburgh in 1869. 
Uh, so the November of 1869 is this historic moment at which they all join and become uh, prospective doctors. It, they are later joined by two other women, and that group is called the Edinburgh Seven. The Edinburgh Seven were very, very famous in this period because the petition to join British universities is fought very publicly in the British press. It is uh, eventually to be fought in front of, uh, it's eventually to be argued over in Parliament as well. Uh, in the late 1860s, a, the women's university education and women's medical education are actually synonymous. And this is a really peculiar phenomenon which is not replicated anywhere else, but it's a, it's really a, a forgotten, not forgotten, I would say, but I think it is a, a neglected phenomenon in the history of women's education in the UK that it is initially all about getting a medical education. And I will say here, and this is the theme I'll return to in a second, why a medical education? The reason that the women give, Sophia Drexblake is willing to argue this case on both absolutely idealistic and absolutely practical grounds. The idealistic grounds are, they are interested, they are, in, they are women who want to be, who want university degrees, they are women who have an aptitude for medicine, they are women with uh, interests in uh, science broadly, biology more narrowly, and then medical science most narrowly of all. Uh, the the more sort of practical grounds, or rather the, the way at which they argue the absolute necessity, is in fact about obstetrics and about gynecology. The argument that these women make is that there are hundreds of thousands of women all over the United Kingdom who will not see a doctor for any complaint that is considered a woman's complaint or any, or any sort of illness, disease, or danger that is considered indelicate. Uh, there are a great number of women who simply will not see a doctor at all and who die of who die in circumstances where they need not die or who are horribly ill in circumstances where they could be well. In order to improve the health of women more broadly all over the country, you have to have women doctors. This is the argument that they make. Uh, there is both a conservative and a liberal side to this argument, which I think in fact has descendants in arguments about public health to this day in a number of countries. At the time, the, the great impediment to allowing women into uh, British university programs and to medical programs is that they will have to take anatomy lessons. And the, our, the, the great public debate at this period is, should women sit in the anatomy classes with men? And there are obviously people who say that absolutely cannot even be countenanced. It was incredibly degrading, incredibly coarsening, and it's something about anatomical knowledge and sexual knowledge being, uh, you know, being given to both sexes at once. Uh, and the idea that the classroom will then somehow become uh, a sexualized space, and the only way to keep it impersonal is for everyone there to be of the same sex. The anatomy class is construed in this moment almost the way we would think of something like a changing room or a locker room in which there is a potential for sexual danger and it has to be controlled. So the argument against this is that these are people who are receiving scientific training and if you, uh, in fact, the real indelicacy is in suggesting that anatomy lessons involve sexual knowledge or involve any kind of sexual frisson. And you'll find essays from the women pioneers of this period saying they absolutely don't. Actually, we are all entering there in a spirit of impersonal scientific curiosity. Uh, it is a problem that that spirit of impersonal scientific curiosity is not understood by the public. And it is a bigger problem that it is not understood by the university senate. Uh, all right. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, all right, what happens next? What happens next is that there, the women then begin to take these lessons for three years. And there's so much more, um, there's in fact so much more 
institutional disruption to their lives and so much, so many more structural hurdles than I can quickly name. Uh, in the first place, the university does grant them admission, but it takes them a year's campaigning to be allowed to sit the exams and join the university. They have to get uh, a number of professors on their side. Those professors then have to uh, vote in the professor's council. Then they have to convince the members of the university senate. Then they have to convince the head of the university. Having done this, there is no obligation for women to, uh, there's no obligation for the professors to admit women into their classes. So again, they're caught in the situation where they're admitted to the university, but they are not admitted to many of the lectures. So there are subjects in which they are uh, admitted and there are subjects in which they have to have private lessons. There are uh, spaces in which they come, uh, the very first year, Edith Peachy, one of the students, comes first in an examination and qualifies for, comes first in the chemistry examination and she qualifies for uh, a scholarship for the next year. The university panics and says, no, no, we can't give scholarships to women. We have to give them to men. So they give it to the man who comes second in the examination rather than the woman who, who came first. So all this stuff happens. In 1872, finally, there is a riot in the surgeon's hall. The male students decide that uh, they cannot have, they, the male students decide that their rights are being infringed upon um, and that the, this is the thin edge of the wedge and soon there'll be women competing with them in the profession. Uh, they riot and they physically push the women out of the surgeon's hall. And then it leads to a broader university education. It leads to a broader university uh, investigation. Uh, and they repeal the women's admission and they are kicked out of the university in 1872 after having done three and a half years of work. Uh, the, they don't eventually get medical degrees until later in the 1870s. And the way it's done is by going to London, raising the funds to form their own college. That college becomes the London School of Medicine for Women. Uh, it's founded by Sophia Jexblake. They hire professors from all the other universities to come in on a guest lecturer basis. Uh, the eventually the way they get their licenses is when the Royal College of Physicians of Ireland grants women the right to sit their examinations. And eventually in 1878, London University opens its doors and allows people to get MDs as well. And in this way, they have the three different things they need. They have the place at which they get the education. They have the license from Ireland. And then if they want the MD, they can take the MD exams at London. But it's this triangular way of getting the same sort of education that the men would get. Elizabeth Blackwell, who famously became, uh, who famously joined the medical register before any of these women did because she was trained in America, is a frequent guest at the London School of Medicine for Women. And uh, I'm just a little bit interested in saying something about her because she's an example of someone who inhabits kind of the sort of the conservative wing of this movement in which she says, um, your medical study can be shocking. It can degrade your morality. But in fact, you have to remember through all of it that the most important thing for women in medical education is Yes, a broader education in science. Yes, a broader education in medicine. Those things are very nice. And I'm glad that you younger women have campaigned for them. But my generation believed, and you should remember that the major grounds for our entry into the profession is obstetric science and obstetric remedies. Uh, and she writes in one of her addresses to the, this is an address called The Influence of Women in the Profession of Medicine, and she speaks um, in the 1880s to the London School of Medicine for Women, and she says, it is very upsetting and shocking that young women today are getting medical degrees and demonstrating so little interest in gynecology and obstetrics in comparison to other fields of medical study. So you have, you know, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell sort of on the, the conservative wing of this movement. Uh, I said I would say something about Lucy Sewell and about the Female Medical Education Society, and I will. That was founded by a Dr. Samuel Gregory. And Samuel Gregory writes this rather extraordinary pamphlet, if I can find it. No, well, apparently I cannot. Ah, yes. A letter to ladies in favor of female physicians for their own sex. 
And this is very early, this is 1854, and he is the person who founds the Female Medical Ed Education Society, which produces these, this vanguard of liberal and progressive women like Lucy Sewell. But it is not a liberal or a progressive institution that he founds. It's in fact, I think, oh, the only way to read it is sort of, um, well, let me just say, he in this pamphlet cites people like, he cites feminists such as Mary Wollstonecraft, but it's otherwise a pretty conservative document. Uh, it is very largely about midwives and about improving the condition of midwives. Uh, and it is about women getting better medical training in order that they can take over uh, midwife duties that are currently being performed by male doctors. And the argument that he advances is actually that, uh, is that the health of women, in, the health of pregnant women and the health of newborns is greatly improved by leaving nature to its own courses. And so because he argues, women are naturally less curious scientists, uh, less given to using equipment, less willing to interfere with the processes of nature, they will be better at this kind of work. And so you should leave it to women also because it is more poorly remunerated and this will allow men to do the better remunerated work of other kinds of medicine. Uh, there's a lot of unpleasant stuff in this document also about how, you know, uh, actually what the medical education for women should do is to teach them to rely on their own instincts. And he talks about the excellent child raising, child rearing, and child birthing instincts of enslaved women and how many of them make excellent midwives at this point. Um, he also cites, as everyone cites in this period, the royal midwives of the French court in the 1850s. So you have all of these different, you have all of these different parts to this story. And I think that what's interesting for us as modern people is that you have, you know, uh, we have this idea in the first place that the women's movement is younger than it is. It's not, it's older. Uh, and also it's, it is, it runs hand in hand. It's like not all of it is uh, has direct descendants in what we think of as contemporary feminism. Uh, and the 1860s are a movement at which actually you see a number of women seeing that the doors of the world have begun to creak. And actually, if you put your shoulder to them and heave, things will change. The stuff that happens in this period is actually remarkable. Universities open to women that have previously been closed. The 1870s see the creation of women BAs, women MAs, women MDs, women PhDs. It's a whole new world. It's completely unlike anything that has preceded it. And yet the grounds on which these battles are fought and the grounds on which these big structural changes are won are not always what we think of as enlightened grounds. And they are not always what match our politics or what always match our concerns now. Uh, this is Mona McLean, which I'm showing you here. It's a, a novel written by Margaret Todd, who. Uh, took many years off in the middle of studying for her MD. Uh, I believe that it was a four-year program and she took eight years to complete it because she took a year off to be in the countryside. She took a year off to write this novel, potentially some others. She returned to it. Margaret Todd, we think, was the romantic partner of Sophia Jex Blake. And uh, it is her writing about her that led me to this narrative, uh, and led me to the life of Sophia Jex Blake. Uh, Mona McLean, medical student, is a novel about uh, a, a woman at the London School of Medicine for Women who encounters many of these hurdles. And she encounters a great number of people asking her, are you sure that you will still be a lady at the end of your education? Are you sure that you will not be coarsened by it? Are you sure that you will still be a Christian? Uh, uh, there's a, this is a, a conversation she has with one of her guardians because she's an orphan. And she's telling him about the, the value of her work and her interest in it. And then he says, you dissect? And she says, yes. Think of that alone. It is human butchery. And she says, of course, you must know that I do not look upon it in that light. Uh, what she says following this is that there is a trash side to every subject, but it is very difficult to convey to the public 
that actually anatomy and dissection are not part of what you want, what she thinks of as the trash side of medicine. It's not the ugly or the disgusting or the coarsening hurdle that you have to go through in order to do a practical life-saving thing. This is the argument that the men in the book constantly advance saying, uh, it is very unfortunate that there are so many women who are going to be ruined by their education, but it is also necessary. Thank you for allowing yourself to be destroyed in your womanhood in order to save the lives of other women, such as my wife, who will need a woman doctor to attend upon her when she has a child. Uh, and the sort of like the private glow of satisfaction that all the young women in the book carry, who are at the medical school, carry about with them is in the knowledge that in doing this kind of work, which seems gritty and bloody uh, and full of coarse sexual knowledge, actually they are the idealists. They are grasping at some ideal notion of how the body works at some, they are like venturing towards some pure conception of systems, some pure idea of science, some idea, uh, some love of ideas, in fact, stripped of any of the, the barriers of sex and the barriers of uh, vulgar material conditions and the vulgar material conditions that they find themselves in. So uh, that the, the, the life of Sophia Jax Blake um, and the, the essay that Sophia Jax Blake publishes on the medical education of women are both dedicated to Dr. Lucy Sewell. So I'm just gonna end by showing you this dedication. Uh, because after all, this is a good story about good changes that happened in the world. Uh, and Sophia Jex Blake dedicates her work to Lucy Sewell, from whose daily life she learns what incalculable blessings may be conferred on the sick and suffering of her own sex by a noble and pure-minded woman who is also a thoroughly scientific physician. Right, thank you. Thank you for such a lovely lecture. <laughs> Shall I stop sharing? I think that I will do that. Great. Yes. Yeah. Um, and typically we invite people to type their questions into the chat. Um, and it looks like we have someone already, which is great. We have a question from Ellen, so I'll read it out to you. Um, so Ellen is curious if women learn what we call pediatrics at this time. You know, they don't appear to in the UK that I can tell. There are some changes to legislation in the 1880s saying that uh, medical education has to be broader and it has to include some subjects, but I don't think pedi pediatrics is among them. I think that the legally mandated expansions are in, again, in obstetrics and in gynecology. But uh, I do think that the New England Women and Children's Hospital was notable as one of these institutions where a lot of people had um, at least sort of specialist experience in pediatrics, but I can't speak to, I can't actually speak to, to what they learned uh, or whether it was a special subject. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that, but it's a good question. And I can venture a yeah. tiny guess, um, which is that I think the discipline of pediatrics is not quite yet formed at this right. historical moment. Yeah. Um, so Colin has a question as well. Yep, that says, uh, oh, yeah. Colin has a comment that pediatrics of the field is only just evolving in the 1860s and that this was part of internal medicine until approximately 1900. Um, and actually Colin's question historically gets me up to my question or my comment, which was uh, thinking about this in the context of my research. I know that um, someone like Gertrude Stein, who went to study medicine in the 1890s in, at Johns Hopkins, um, I think in a way, even though it's such a short space of time later, mm -hmm. um, really didn't experience um, hurdles in the same way. And so I wonder if you might have a sense based on your comparative analysis of Boston and the and Edinburgh and London, um, how different a uh, sort of um, cultural space it is for people, for women pursuing higher education in, in the UK and, and in the US. Yeah, it is a very different space in, the, in America and in, in the, 
and the UK already by the 1860s, because you know, the mere existence of places like Oberlin and co-educational spaces like that is un, at the time still being debated in the United Kingdom. Uh, also, the fact that there are women MDs by the 1860s is a signal of distinction. Uh, the number of MDs in England does grow pretty rapidly. Uh, I think that in 1877, there are seven women registered as medical practitioners in the UK, just seven by 1897 that number is 345. So the London School of Medicine for Women is the thing that changes that. I also think the real hurdle in the UK at the time is that it's very difficult to be a female, uh, it's very difficult to be a woman university student in total because there's nowhere to live. This is one of the things that Savia Jacks Blake's life and her biography talks about is that you go to London and there's no such thing as a single young woman going to university, renting a couple of rooms uh, at this moment. She has to sort of invent it. Even when she's at Queens College London, when she fights with the dormitory people, she has to find lodging for herself. And that's just unheard of. The idea of like bachelor woman student is a, is a thing in the UK by the 1880s. And it's not at all a thing in the 1860s. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Colin has a comment uh, related to this, that there remained many hurdles, even in the late 19th century. And yeah. Hopkins, where Gertrude Stein studied, was a bit of an exception, as women were admitted on an equal basis since the founding of the medical school. That's quite interesting. Yeah, um, and I could tell you the thing about the Harvard is also that there is a petition for the, the women to be admitted to classes at Harvard in 1860. Sophia Jackson co-writes it with a couple of people. Yeah. Harvard says no. Ah, but okay. yeah, it is one of the places that says no before uh, Cambridge says no when she goes back to the UK. Yeah. Right. And Radcliffe exists at the time, but it's not nearly on par. Is that true? Mm -mm. And they don't sit the same examinations. Yeah. Um, so the rest of what Colin had to say was that um, women helped raise the funds to open the medical school at, at Johns Hopkins, including Mary Garrett and her peers. But in contrast, Harvard would not women admit women to his medical school until the mid 1940s. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same pattern, right? The London School of Medicine for Women has to be privately funded. Uh, and it's not a, an institution that makes back any money for several years. And in fact, it seems that Sophia Jax Blake is a good administrator, maybe not a great college principal because she's constantly, you know, the students are constantly filing complaints against her for like negligent attendance on the university and things. But Cool. Well, I wonder if anyone else might have want to chime in with a question because I feel like uh, I've been dominating the conversation a fair bit. I did have a, a thought and I don't know. Um, I was going to ask you okay. also, Kim, yeah. whether you had an idea what electromagnetic device uh, <laughs> Lucy Sewell could have wanted to place against the Biogex Blake space. Oh, it's the 1860s. Um, I mean, there were all sorts of things. Uh, but uh, uh, Vignesh is asking me this because my research specialty is um, history of electricity and medicine. Um, uh, chances are it's some kind of battery um, uh, with um, like maybe that has been like um, soaked in salt water to have some sort of mm -hmm. contact with the skin. Um, those were pretty common in that moment. Um, not terribly effective, but right. <laughs> people were into them. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting stuff with electromagnetism going on and like those sort of weird borders of medicine and what we now, like um, what we now, call quackery, right? And this is very much connected to medicine professionalizing itself in this moment, totally. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the question I wanted to raise, which is um, maybe uh, less exciting, um, but uh, see, the one thing that struck me that I hadn't thought about at all based on um, your presentation was this idea that um, the, the admittance of these women to medical schools was so hotly debated in the in the public press and in the public sphere more broadly, and uh, that there was a riot within the school 
And I was thinking about corollaries from, you know, my study of American culture. And the only really strong corollary that I can think of is, in fact, busing and desegregation of the American public school system in the 1950s and 60s, which produces the same kind of violent public outcry and the same kind of riots. Um, and um, yeah, I'm wondering, I don't know if there's a question built into that, but I'm, I'm wondering sort of how these moments might be tied together in ways we haven't thought of before. Yeah, I mean, I will say that the the violence, such as it is, is internal to the profession, right? And that it is the the young male medical students who, in fact, try to throw the women physically out of the university. Uh, but yeah, you will find references to the entry of women into the University of Edinburgh in the Guardian, in the Times, in the Lancet, in even in Punch. Uh, and then you will find a great deal of public conversation about the young woman who uh, came first in the chemistry exam and was denied the scholarship as well the next year. It's in all the papers. When eventually the University of Edinburgh kicks them out in 1872, uh, they, one possibility is in fact uh, to take them to court, but instead they sort of ride a tide of public indignation on their behalf, which is like, you know, uh, maintained by the, by the popular press uh, to found the London School. So the, the, press is, the press is divided as well, the press is on their side or? or... Yeah, the, it's a sort of a mixed response. And I think that uh, Sophia Jexplik is considered someone who is quite good at getting the press on her side and is quite good at getting public opinion on her side. Uh, I think that the, you find people writing in, you also find like letters to the editor at the time saying, uh, well, I offering different reasons why women should not be in those classes. And one of them is, well, we all know that women have imitative brains rather than creative brains. So, you know, it's true that they may be able to like memorize the, they may be able to memorize the medical information, but they will never contribute to research, right? So why should they get MDs? And to all of these, I think that one of the things about her is that she never allows herself to be deviated. She never allows herself to be sidetracked. And she always returns with um, being excellent at research is not uh, currently a requirement for men to be doctors. So maybe you should leave aside the question of whether I will do any, uh, just give me the exams and see if I pass them. Like constantly the refrain is, give us the same exam, see if we pass. Give us the same exam, see if we pass. Um, can you say more? Someone's asking a question about the perceived uh, threat of women in anatomy lectures. Um, yeah, it, I don't actually, you know, it's, um, you find it in, uh, it's one of the things that it's debated a lot in the, in the press. It's one of the things that you'll find arguments for and against in all of the, the newspapers of the period. Uh, and they are sort of reconciled to the idea that those women are going to join the University of Edinburgh, but you find letters for and against their joining the same classes as the men, including the anatomy class. Uh, yeah, the, in the event, it turns out that a number of those male professors do not allow them into their lectures and they do have to take the lectures separately. And that means that they have to pay for separate lectures. It's sometimes hard to disentangle the genuinely felt disgust of the kind which says, you cannot be in my class along with the young men. It would be totally indecent from the desire to say, no, you actually have to take my class separately and then, you know, pay me separately. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to read some of these professorial responses from the period a little bit cynically in that way. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't have very much more insight into it, except like one has to imagine a, a period in which, uh, you know, the sort of like medical knowledge about sex is widely available, but also unspeakable. Um, and to speak of it aloud in a mixed gender setting is uh, at least arguably a grounds on which you can exclude someone from being in the room. Yeah. Yeah. On, and on that note, uh, we hopefully won't exclude anyone from 
future rooms or <laughs> from this room at least. Um, I think it, we have hit our time. So I'm going to say thank you so much to everyone who's here. And thank you to those of you who have been wa who watch online in the future. Um, and just uh, wanted to, again, um, put that link in the chat. If you guys are willing to fill out our survey, we'd be deeply appreciative. And um, this is the sixth in a longer series. Our next lecture will take place on October 10th, or sorry, October 20th at six o'clock p.m. And the speaker is Aparna Nair. Um, uh, and uh, she will be talking about why social media matters for physicians, public perceptions of, of epilepsy. So we hope you can join us then. Thank you so much. Thanks all.